Louise Bedford here, your host of the Mind Over Markets segment, joined by Jordan Meller. How are you, Jordan? I'm great, Louise. How are you? Fabulous. It is so great that you're here with me today because I need your help. Firstly, the thing is, I have been sent so many fantastic questions, questions that I didn't even consider covering on this show. And I need your help to answer them because there are some traders and people in need here. They need to fix up some of those little mindset blocks, those things that get in the way of them and trading excellence. We can be our own worst enemy in the markets, there is no doubt. And this is the exact segment that we need to be able to fix those problems so that these traders can move on. And I'll bet if you're listening, you will relate to one or more of these problems. So to kick off, Jordan, mm. you know I love putting you on the spot. This is this is absolutely the time of the week that brings me joy. So today is absolutely no different. So as I mentioned, it's Trader Q&A Corner today, but I've started out with a little test for you, Jordan. So we'll see how you go. The first one's really easy and you should be able to pass this. I want you to read the words, but not the colours of this list. So just read these words out, Jordan. Cat, dog, pony, dolphin, shark. You're pretty confident? Yep. Excellent. All right. Now, what I want you to do, this next part of the test isn't so simple. I want you to read the colours. So say the colour and not the word. Red, blue, green, black, purple. You are really good. <laughs> you are really good, Jordan. That is exceptional because a lot of people have difficulty with that. Now, if you were just listening to something else while you were listening to Jordan, if you were watching something else, then for goodness sake, go back and you try that list yourself. Jordan, you are an exceptionally clear thinker. Which list did you find easier? The first list where the visual input and the written word matched or the second list where the colour and the word did not match, which was easier for you? Uh, I could, if I was timed, I reckon I could do the first list quicker. Um, it's the first word that's the hardest. But once I know what I'm doing, the rest is easy. <laughs> now let's have a think about how this relates in terms of our trading worlds. Because often in the markets, we are given conflicting signals. This leads to confusion and delays, and there's a psychological tally with this. Every time we have something that is a conflicting signal or something that is ambiguous, not only do we take longer, but our physiological symptoms actually increase in terms of we are getting ready for fight light or freeze. Now, unfortunately, we are hardwired to take conflicting signals as being a threat. It's a personal threat to us. We're not sure quite how we're going to handle this. And it brings about those changes. Now, we've got one of two directions that we can go in. We can see those changes as being negative, in which case, whenever we're around stress, we will consider that to be a drain on our resources. But what if I was to tell you that the research is all to do with the framing? If you consider that heightened state of awareness to be you're excited, you're getting ready to trade, it's starting to be go time, then if you perceive it that way, you are more likely to respond well to those conflicting signals and to those ambiguous inputs. So it's all to do with the way we frame how we're feeling and it's pre-framing. It is not after the fact. We have to think of this now because before we trade, before we even touch our keyboard, we have to be in the right frame of mind. Don't you agree, Jordan? I agree. I agree. You've got to be ready to go. You really do. You really do. So let's have a look at some of the questions that people came up with when I asked for some input. And you do have this option. As a loyal Trade Delicious watcher, listener, YouTube devotee, 
you can send me louise at tradingsecrets.com.au. You can send me your questions and I might even address them on the very next show. So let's have a look at the first one here. When I'm on a winning streak, I size up and overconfidence creeps in. When I eventually lose, I do have a tendency to have tunnel vision and I give back a lot of realized profits. How can I detect when I'm overconfident or euphoric? Now, I want to spend some time on this because you notice that I highlighted a couple of words there to be able to help us out there. So the key words are overconfidence and tunnel vision. So that is where we are at. Now, Jordan, I'd love to have a shot at this first to talk about this particular listener issue, problem, Mm -hmm. and then I'd like you to formulate your thoughts as well, and then perhaps you can give me an alternative view of reality. (laughs) So I think that would be the best way. Now, when we're talking about overconfidence, one of the best ways to beat overconfidence, and this is clinically proven, is to work to a set of predefined rules. Now, those predefined rules in the trading world, we call a trading plan, but a trading plan is only as good as your ability to follow it. Your accountability has to be there either to yourself or to somebody external. So I want you to think about firstly, what happens when you're feeling overconfident? What are the physiological symptoms that you're displaying so that you can recognize it early on in the cycle? If you think about that example where you're reading those answers that I'm asking for, those those easy words, and then you add a bit of conflict there, that the time delay and the stress goes up. How can you detect that feeling in your body before you actually go and do something that creates an action? That is your first step. So looking at your predefined rules, noticing physiological symptoms. And the other thing I'd suggest is regular self-assessment. Now, as you know, I love trading journals to do this type of self-assessment, and I constantly look through my journal once a month to go back into the past to see are there any themes in my life. So I didn't actually do this for quite a while and (laughs) I found this theme of me and my sister that went for three or four years. I fixed it by actually introspectively reading back through my journal and realising it was a problem. So it wasn't that good. So I do think that self-assessment is very important. And the other thing is that often we are so busy, we don't take breaks. So taking a break is so important. Just being able to have that pause. If you can build that pause in your trading day, that can really help. It can be as simple as taking a deep breath. It can be as simple as feeling a different texture in your hand. So I personally, in front of my trading desk, I keep a few different things. This is a little satin feeling thing. So I've got like lots of different feeling things in front of me. I've got felt as well. So just feel something so that you're, okay, I'm focusing on the thing that I feel like the pen. Yes. And the the texture, (laughs) think about how you're feeling as you're touching that particular item. Don't do it mindlessly. Don't just go, okay, I've done it. Tick. That's because Louise and Jordan said it would be a good idea. Actually, Take a bit of a pause and say to yourself, okay, just before my trading day starts, I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to feel my feely thing. And then I'll be more in the mindset of being able to be prepared. Now, that is what I would suggest for overconfidence. But Jordan, I'm sure you're going to have some other ideas here. Yeah, the, the first thing that popped to my mind when I read that uh, that message there was, is it a result of the way you're trading or is it a result of just how the market's printing for you, right? So straight away, I'm on a winning streak, I size up. Okay, you need, before you start sizing up, you need to understand, is this a result of what you're doing or are you just following the plan? And if you are just following the plan, okay, this is better, (laughs) right? I like it. It's either going to tell you, hey, whether I size up or not, this this is the results that we're going to get, but it's also going to tell you your average win streak length. 
Uh, and for me, I know my average win streak. You know, if I go 13 trades on the trot of winning, I know the 14th, 15th, or 16th has a high percentage of being a loser. Uh, my trading plan, my trading strategy doesn't suffice 100% win rate. Um, so what I like to do is just kind of reaffirm that I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. And the statistics back up, at least previously, that this will happen occasionally and it will end occasionally. So I stop myself from thinking I'm the best trader in the world. I'm, I'm hitting you know all these winners on the trot because I know it's not really a direct result to what I'm doing. It's more my strategy is just performing at this point in time. Um, so that always humbles me a little bit. Uh, I know it's not a direct correlation to what I'm doing, so I'm able to think a little bit clearer. And uh, and that's, uh, I think, massively important. Understand how what your average win streak is. Understand how you're, if traded correctly, how your strategy will result in different themes. And I think that can kind of make you realize or, or at least separate performance from yourself and profit that can be can be taken from the market. Yeah, I love it. There's a few things that you touched on there. I'm going to go on to the next problem because there's some correlations between what you've just said and the next problem. I do think what you're talking about, Jordan, here is knowing yourself, knowing your plan and knowing what your usual behavior is. You know, so often we think of ourselves as, oh my gosh, I'm some sort of freak. But actually for you, this could be normal behavior. This could be normal behavior. It's when we're trying to stray out of those boundaries of normality. Those extremes are often where we need support or for somebody like us to shine a light into that mm. blind spot. So I do think what you're saying there is, is fantastic. Let's have a look at this next problem. How would I stop my mind from attaching to physical things for every trade that I take? So I think what we're talking about here is being in a materialistic world as well. So my mind instantly connects something which could be bought in the real world. This issue is becoming increasingly more apparent as my risk increases. Is there something I could do to remove this temptation altogether? Oh, now that's a big one, isn't it? Now, Jordan, I do have some definite ideas on this, and I'm sure you're formulating some thoughts here as we speak. But I do think we are trapped in such a comparative world. We see the person with the car, the jet ski, this, the woman that we want, and this actually stimulates us in a very primal way. Now, a lot of this comes back to basic caveman mentality of our limbic system competing with our more modern brain, our prefrontal cortex. That's the outside of our brain, especially at the front here. The left prefrontal cortex is known as our parental control. So if you've ever had that voice that says, don't buy that, you don't need that, that is your parental control. That's your prefrontal cortex overriding your limbic system. So having a bit of an understanding that this is actually the way it goes for every human, I think is a good start. But let's talk about temptation because we're talking about the money on the table that looks so appealing because you can buy that, insert what you want there, boat. You can buy that car. You can buy that new piece of sound equipment. You're actually relating it to something that you could have as a comfort item. Firstly, do we need to seek comfort? You have to ask yourself that. So I think sometimes when we deprive ourselves of something, it's quite Jungian. It is that which we seek to deny, we empower. If you're saying you're depriving yourself of something and it's pretty much that's the way you live your life, you're more likely to have a binge or break out in some way. Now, for example, people who try to give up alcohol, they say, I'm not going to have any alcohol. It is poison. I'm not going to touch it. But then they spend 24 hours a day thinking of alcohol <laughs> because that yep. deprivation makes them more hyper aware and our selective perception kicks in. So I want you to shift your focus. Firstly, concentrate on the process of trading rather than what it can achieve. Remind yourself that the goal is actually to follow your trading plan to the letter and not skip any part of it and don't shortcut your way to success. So that's got to be the goal of every trader. And I want you to consider detaching from money. 
Think in terms of percentage rather than the actual money that is coming into your account. If that's coming up on the screen loud, loud and clear, it's extremely difficult. Sometimes there can be a setting that you can use in your brokerage platform to switch it so that it doesn't show or only shows for closed trades. And sometimes for some platforms, you can switch it to a percentage. Percentages are much easier to get our head around. And that will also take you further when you're actually growing your account. Because if you're trading with $20,000, if you're getting hooked up on the money coming in from that, that'll be very different when your account is $5 million. But the percentage is actually a purer way to think of it. I also want you to focus on mindfulness and visualization. So that clarity and that calmness before you trade so that you're not in a hot state, you're not already heightened before you enter the market. That's very important. And also to consider your reward systems. Now we are very prone to having habits and getting a reward and that is what enforces a habit. So it's often a cue or a trigger, then the action, and then the reward. And repeat, we go round and round and round. Sometimes it can only take one time for you to actually have that reward for it to be strong enough so that you will repeat that action. I'll give you an example. My daughter and I, we love going to yoga. And once after yoga, we found a Reese's ice cream with caramel and peanut butter a great big tub of it. Both of us, we shot our hand out so fast to that fridge. We bumped our hands together. Both of us wanted it that bad. We sat down, <laughs> we ate the tub of this ice cream. It was the most glorious thing. I, ca I can't recommend it enough. But you know, the next yoga lesson, the very next yoga lesson, both of us said, oh, we feel like some ice cream took just one hit. So look at your reward systems. What do you get a kick out of? And I would suggest that dopamine fix that you're looking for, it shouldn't be coming from the markets directly. It should be internally driven rather than mm -hmm. externally driven. Now, I know I've given you a lot of food for thought there, Jordan, but I would love your thoughts. I'm sure there's things that you will come up with that I haven't covered with this. Yeah, first of all, good job delaying responding to my previous answer because it is very correlated and I'm going to just reiterate myself. The difference between what you've done and what the market's given you and, and that's kind of what we're doing here, right? You, you want to really make sure you're following your process and if you do that correctly, hopefully the money will come, right? If the strategy's right, the plan's right and everything's right for you, you follow the process. You want to focus on your rewarding being on how well you followed that process, not on how much money you've made. Uh, we can obviously talk about normal things like as quick as the money can come in, it can go out. Okay, It's not yours till it's realized, until it's in your bank account. It's not yours. Um, I, I've never really struggled with the, the idea of wanting to go out and spend all that money on something. So I'm, I think I'm lucky there because um, it, it, it's, it's not something I, I've actually kind of processed um but uh, yeah i think you have to detach yourself from your profit uh like you said um we're, we're changing your, your pnl change it to pips on mt5 for fx traders you can change it to pips or points uh which will just give you that little bit more clarity and moving forward detach yourself from where that money can be don't rely on the money uh is also a really good one because you won't be sitting there thinking this will pay my month's rent uh if you're not if everything else is paid for through other means then you can focus on solely just stick into your strategy uh, i think there's a, a lot of, of nuggets you just put there and there's, there's one more that's that's really sticking out to me and i just can't put it on the tip of my tongue uh and i was gonna gonna talk about it and it's just completely left me i um, want to say that money flees need so if hmm. you are hungry and if you are saying i have to get the market to perform i have to get that amount of money into my account then this is going to actually foul up your own trading psychology we think in the outside of trading world the goal setting is the way to go we think that if we say i want to get this lofty goal then the rest of our life will fall into some sort of semblance of order so that we can achieve that
Now, that is fantastic in the non-trading world, but I'm yet to see that become established as an effective practice for traders. We cannot pitch ourselves against a specific dollar amount coming into our account every single week, month, minute, whatever your time increment is. It just does not work. So be careful about how you're positioning your goal setting in relation to this. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you've heard this, Louise, before. I'm sure I would have told you before, but uh, I did goal setting uh, in my trading career and it was a little bit different. I had a calendar up on the wall, an old school calendar, you know, before you could get the electric ones on the walls. Uh, and I had a book of like the children's stars, the stickers, you know, little ones you get in school Love every it. day that I traded correctly. Made money, lost money, doesn't matter, but I traded to my rule base, I'd put a sticker on that day. Um, and I can tell you now, it killed me if I went a month and there was a couple days missing. It absolutely killed me. So I did everything I could for the next following month to make sure there was a sticker on every single day. It had nothing to do with how much money I made. It had nothing to do whether I made money or lost money. What it mattered was I stuck to my plan. As a coincidence, I made money. As a coincidence, it helped, right? It did. But what that goal setting was, was I am going to trade to my plan for the next 30 days, regardless of whether I win or lose. I'm going to do what I've set out to do. And I think that's where people need to start looking at goals on performance based on how you bring yourself to the market, how you really look at it, not necessarily in what money. Because sometimes you can do every single thing right and still not make money. That's trading. That's trading. There's risk, uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's a process. And I just remembered what I was going to say in the last one. Um, we talked about rewards, uh, rewards, and and this goes out to all my FX traders <laughs> and trade delicious. I know there's a few of you. Um, the the industry has been very gamified with the way that new new prop firms are coming through. And every 10, 10% that you make, you get rewarded with a certificate, you get rewarded with a bigger account, you get rewarded with all of this. And what we see is a lot of people just gamble that extra 2% of the account just to try Because if I get there, I get it and it works. And you best believe, like you just mentioned, they move into that next step, that next phase, the double the account size and that mentality of, well, it worked last time. What if I just took an extra little bit of a risk here to, to get to that next level, to get that next certificate, to get that next reward? And it is so, so dangerous. You need to be very aware of why you're hunting for something and what's really going to help you get there and what's just risky that's bad habits. Mm, I love it. There's so many things here. Firstly, you're talking about looking at input instead of outcome. Now, I want yep. to define this for you. So you're doing everything you can to be a good trader, but you're not measuring yourself on the outcome. And that is pure brilliance. That is plus one for you, Jordan, because that's high performance. That is elite athlete performance there. That's how sports psychologists talk to their clients about how to get the best out of their performance. So that's great. And the other thing that you mentioned, which I think is great, it's called don't break the chain. Now, this is a very powerful part of habit formation where you're putting your gold stars on and it killed you to skip a day because then you have to start again. Now, if you look at some of the apps out there, like a meditation app that I'm very hooked on is Calm, C-A-L-M, mm -hmm. Calm. That's got this really insidious don't break the chain concept and it tells you how many days you've been meditating for and you really don't want to miss a day because, you know, then you wouldn't be who you thought you were, this reliable, identity-based, strong I do what I say I'm going to do type of person. So that don't break the chain is a powerful way of reinforcing our own identity as a trader and reinforcing it in the right direction. So 10 out of 10 for that. Yes. Did you know that's what it was called, Jordan? No. The don't I break the chain. I, I know yeah, yeah. I know, I know the, the, the hit that you do because you get it in everywhere now. You get it yes. in in gaming in apps in in on even tv shows you can get that you know you've been twitch for example you've been watching for said amount of days on the trot and you, you get a little badge so yeah i, I can see the psychological uh, play that uh, platforms and, and things have for that so clever because they're just trying to be sticky aren't they they're trying to keep you coming back like a dopamine addict i do mm -hmm. want to talk about dopamine just for a moment because i do think yeah. this is related there is 
a lot of dopamine flooding into our system now that is our reward. Our reward is some chemical hit. It's like cocaine straight into our veins. When we do mm. something right, when we get a kick out of a video game, for example. Now they've looked at dopamine and they've actually found if they take the dopamine receptors out of a tiny little rat, right? Because there's actually receptors in your brain and you can actually cauterize them. So you can stop that rat from experiencing dopamine. It might be secreted, but it's not taken up. Now, what they found with those little rats is that the little rats, they just couldn't be bothered going to get food. So they just sat in the side of their cage. They seemed happy enough, but nothing motivated them to actually walk across the the cage to get the food. If they put the food right in front of the rat's face, the rat would actually go for it. But other than that, no, two steps is too much. So what dopamine does is it creates a deep desire. It triggers off motivation to create the action. Now, if you think about that in relation to the psychology around this is DOSE, D-O-S-E, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins, okay? So those are the four magic words, the, the way that we can utilize this as a trader. Let me just get back to that for the moment. So dopamine is where we have that desire to do well and we get some sort of reward and it's reinforced. Oxytocin, I'm encouraging everybody right now to give themselves a little hug because that's giving you oxytocin. It's giving you a feel good habit reinforcing technique. When you make a win and you followed your plan, do something to give yourself that hug. Pat your dog, stroke your cat's face, you know, do something that's going to release that oxytocin. Serotonin is where we beat our own depression. So that is your feel-good hormone that is a relaxant and it is something that means that you're not going into that spectrum of dark thoughts that mood tunnel that jeff warren talks about so this is something where we need to be aware if we're entering a mood tunnel so that we circumvent that and we pull back so if you're starting to feel black you've got your dopamine and you've got your oxytocin to help but also the final one to help is endorphins. Now, endorphins are most likely secreted when we are with other people. So I look forward to our chats every single week, Jordan, and that is an endorphin fix for me. I know it is. So as a trader, if you're attaching to materialistic physical things, which is what our, our question was about, mm -hmm. materialistic physical things, then I would suggest that you get back to your own physicality in your body. Use D-O-S-E, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins. Play with your own chemical balance because you can and you can devote two seconds to be able to get some level of serotonin into your body. The easiest way is to take a deep breath. You are flooded with serotonin. So I would suggest if you're attaching to physical things, play with your own physical chemistry. Your thoughts on that, Jordan? Yeah, it's deeper than what I would have suggested. Uh, I think it's fair to say you know a lot more than me when it comes to the psychological side of things. Uh, yeah, uh, my advice would just be like detach from uh, from some of these things. But obviously, you can give people the exactly how to do that and and where to look to get that fulfillment rather than than the the um, materialistic endeavors in which which this market's filled with really. It really is. And it is all around us. And we are in such a precarious position now because what we are facing as people living in this world is we are being flooded with external stimulus. Now, if you think about internal versus external, internal things are things that you can do for yourself that don't rely on the external world and external is where we can watch a movie i think that combination of those two is very important you're never going to avoid the external world completely but if you're relying on tiktok or instant fixes because it's an external source they are very sticky and you can become very addicted 
to them because of that dose system. So your dopamine will fire, your serotonin will say just stay in the same place because it feels good. Your endorphin will actually increase because you think this is a surrogate for connection, which is a shame. It's not really hitting your oxytocin unless we move into a completely different area of the internet, which we won't discuss today. But you can imagine that that particular area, which is the most popular area of the internet, also increases oxytocin. So no wonder people get addicted to porn and no wonder people get addicted to those quick fixes. Now, Jordan, I've loved chatting with you about these listener and I guess viewer issues. Mm. There is so much depth that we can go into here, but I think we should cap it there. I've got a lot of other questions that people have asked that I would love to cover in another segment. Any parting words, Jordan? If, if this has sparked something for you, you've got some feedback or you have questions you want answered as well, even if they are really to what you are, as I said, reach out to Louise, reach out to myself, even get in the comments section, wherever you can, chuck it out because we do read, we do listen, uh, and we will bring it in a future episode. Absolutely. And Jordan, your knowledge is just spectacular. So thanks so much for playing along and we will see you in the very next Mind Over Market segment. Thanks, Louise.